All right, good morning, everyone. So I gotta tell you, I've really been looking forward to this, not only because I did this five years ago, but also because after school programs were a big part of my life, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But I have to tell you that I've been really looking forward to this since Friday. And that's when I landed at JFK with my wife and four-year-old, and it's been a hellish weekend with them. <laughs> and it's really the four-year-old who, who really wanted to taste the best bagel in the world because she's been told her whole life that the best bagels in the world are in New York City. And so on Saturday morning, we got a bagel and she goes and bites into it and she's like, yeah, that's not it. <laughs> Sunday, takes another bite, nope, that's not it. So we're in search of the perfect bagel. So I, the, all of Saturday, all of Sunday, it's like, man, I cannot wait to get up at six o'clock in the morning on Monday to get out of there. So I'm here, excited to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I, let me introduce myself. I am the Chief Education Evangelist at Google. I've been at Google now for 13 years, which is the longest I've done anything in my life. I uh, started in the in Phoenix area. I live in Phoenix, and I was part of the team. And when I say team, it was just two of us that launched Google Apps for Education into the university space back then in 2006. That's the CIO at ASU when we launched it. I launched Google Apps into K-12, and I launched Chromebooks into education since the last time I was here. So together, you know, we had about 100 million students around the world using these tools. Our team has grown from two people to 100 people, and my job is really to be kind of the advisor, the thought leader, the expert on education internally at Google to kind of be like the Yoda of, for people where, uh, where I just kind of sit in my cave in Phoenix and people come to me with ideas and I bless them and those sorts of things. So that's what I do <laughs> with my job at Google. I also have the chance to fly around the world and speak at events like this and other events on technology, Generation Z, uh, what's happening in the world of work, those types of things, so I get to do that. And as also mentioned, I help start a school in Phoenix called the Phoenix Coding Academy. And this is a, a public school. It's not a private school, not a private, not a charter school. It's a public school uh, as part of the Phoenix Union School District focused on computer science as embedded into all the subjects that kids are learning. So it's computer science and art, computer science and history in a cross-disciplinary way. Uh, we're three years in, some great results so far. Kids love it. You know, we're, we haven't even gone through our, four, our fourth cycle yet. So, we're still learning, still iterating, still trying to do things better. That's what we do in Phoenix. And I also teach 10th grade communication skills. I'm in the classroom teaching students. And if those of you who work with 10th graders, you know you don't really teach them anything. You just survive 10th graders. <laughs> um, and so I do that. And as mentioned, we, I, wrote, I co authored a book with a child psychologist that's outside. And, but the, really th the thing that I'm really excited about is that I am trying to become a YouTube star. <laughs> Just to impress my daughter, who thinks that the most famous people in the world are on YouTube kids. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, so you're going to subscribe to my channel, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but that's, that's kind of what I am focused on. But I want to start with this idea of what you can see is that I'm passionate about education. And I'm passionate about education because education, to me, is the most important thing that we can focus on. Education changes families' destinies. Education disrupts poverty, right? That's what education does. And I know this because it happened for me. I'm one of those kids that we often talk about who need programs the most. I am a first-generation American, born and raised right here in Hell's Kitchen, New York, right? Yeah, who are the New Yorkers in the room? Yeah, you're usually louder and more annoying than that, but. It's, it's too early in the morning? No, Monday morning. Uh, but I grew up with a single mother. Now, in, in, and I grew up on welfare and food stamps in Hell's Kitchen, New York. Now, I'm not talking about the one that you go now to, which is a great neighborhood. My daughter actually lives there, but not that neighborhood. The, I'm talking about the neighborhood. If this event was happening in, in 1982, there would be like barriers around you. Like, no, do not go into that neighborhood. I'm talking about the New York from the 70s and 80s, when it wasn't a great place to live. 
Do you remember the movie Escape from New York? Yeah, I thought that was a documentary. That's how, <laughs> that's what New York was like in the 70s and 80s. It wasn't a great place to be. But I know, you know, what I saw as what I needed was education. So I graduated high school, went to college, went to graduate school, but one of the things, and why I was excited to talk to you guys, because one of the things that I, I, I credit my success to was the after school programs that I was involved with. And the after school program that means the most to me is the PAL in, uh, initiative. Any, who's our PAL folks? Any PAL folks in the room? They're too busy. Um, the, the PAL that was on 52nd Street and 11th Avenue, that place saved me, right? Because that's where me and my friends would go and have activities and learn, uh, play basketball. That's where I, st I started going there, I think, in seventh grade. And that's where I started playing basketball. That's where I was. That's where I spent most of my time. And we all loved gathering there. And I don't know what would have happened to me if that's not where I spent my time after school. I can tell you what happened to my friends who didn't spend time in after school programs like that. But that was valuable to me and was part of my success. Now, I've had an amazing 25 years since graduating from graduate school, everything from flying in an F-16 to hanging out with gorillas in Africa to speaking at the White House and everything. But the one that super, supersedes all of them is this experience. When I got a chance to speak at the White House in front of the president and the first lady when Michelle Obama had a Reach Higher initiative, and I went, and she asked me, she called me and said, hey, can you come speak at the White House? And I said, let me check my calendar. <laughs> no, you, I wish I was that cool, right? No. I went, spoke at the White House in front of the president and first lady, and I still am amazed by this picture when I see it, right? This idea that, doesn't it look like one of those pictures you get at the state fair where they, <laughs> where they green screen you in to the back? And... When I, show, when I posted this picture on social media, my friends were like, yeah, so what? You spoke at the White House. But that's how your friends are supposed to be. All the commentary was about the suit. They did not know I owned a suit. They were, <laughs> they were impressed that I had a suit. It's the same suit I've had for like 10 years. But anyway, that was the most nervous I've ever been in my life. Not just because the president and first lady was the audience, not the cameras, but I, the whole time I'm speaking, I'm feeling George Washington stare at the back of my neck. I just feel that. <laughs> And I show you this picture, one, because you know, I want to show off a little bit, but I show you this picture because that's the power that education has. You can take a street kid hoodlum from Hell's Kitchen who walks up to the microphone, speaks in the White House, still all he wants to do is say Baba Booey into the microphone, but doesn't do that, and, and, and gets to speak at the White House. That's the power and potential of education. That's what we can do. But here's the thing we don't think about that the impact that we have on students goes on and on and on. It's not just the students that you face. You could be doing this work for two years, 20 years, 40 years, and you will have an impact on students that you will never meet in your whole life, no matter how long you do this for. And I know it's true because now I have my own kids, and this is them. No, don't awe them. That four-year-old, like six months ago, called me an asshole. Do not awe them. <laughs> I, have, I have a 26-year-old, a 17-year-old, and a four-year-old. Yeah, I can only handle one kid at a time. <laughs> when they're all in the same room, like this weekend, it drives me crazy. But, my 26-year-old lives here in House Kitchen on 48th Street and 9th, 8th Avenue in the same neighborhood I grew up in. She moved here from Phoenix to be a video producer, living her dream job. She works at CNN. She makes fake news. She loves... <laughs> she's, she's really good at it. She, um, she lives, she lives here in House Kitchen, graduated from college three years ago, and we never talked about college. We never had a conversation about whether she's going to go to college or not. She just assumed she's going to college. 
because that's what her life was like. Her mother went to college, I went to college, people in her life went to college. She actually assumed she was going to go to graduate school because I went to graduate school and her mother's also a teacher and she went to graduate school. She assumed I was going to pay for that, but we, uh, <laughs> we took care of that really very, very fast. But they, that, that's what she's doing today because of the education system I had. My 17-year-old has just decided, declared that he's going to attend Arizona State University. Yeah, yeah, not live at home though, no. His room's going to be turned into a workout room 10 seconds after he leaves. But he, uh, he's going he's, to, he's, he, we never had a conversation about whether he's going to go to college or not. He just knows he's going to go to college. That's, and I don't even know if he's going to graduate because he's, you know, he's going to do this and this. He wants to go to Europe. For, but that's my point is that they don't know that it was my fourth grade teacher, my ninth grade teacher, my after school programs, my college professors, all the people that impacted me in my life, that they get to live the life they live because of that. That's the impact that we have, that it goes on for generations and generations and generations. And so if our job is to prepare kids through education for the future, when I say education, I don't mean K through 12. I mean everything that we do in education. If our job is to do that, we need to see what the state of education is. And this is usually the part where education reformers will talk about how education is broken today. I don't say education is broken. I don't think it's broken. If you understand the history of education, you understand that we've done some amazing things with education in this country. I can't say it's broken because it worked for me. And by the way, it also worked for all of you. Has it worked for everyone? No. But that we can focus on, that we can fix. But this idea that education is broken, or that edu the, other, the other narrative that you hear all the time is education hasn't changed in 150 years. Abraham Lincoln could walk into a classroom and, or, or you know, Abraham Lincoln showed up, he would see the world and be amazed by what we've been able to do, and then, but he would walk into a classroom and he'd feel comfortable because education hasn't changed in 150 years. That's not true either. Also, they don't really know Abraham Lincoln because he would not recognize the classroom because he never went to school. But that's a whole other problem. I don't think that that narrative works. I don't think that you, that works very well. Technology has been part of our lives for the past 150 years, believe it or not, if you define technology in, in a broad sense. In the 1900s, motion pictures were introduced in the, into education when that was invented. In the, in the 50s, television and video was introduced into education. And computers are not new in education. We've been talking about computers since at least the 70s in education. I remember that I took a computer class right here in New York City. I think I was in ninth grade, and I was told that computers were going to be important in the future. And I had never seen a computer. So I took a programming class, the first language I learned how to program in. And I learned how to program in BASIC. And some of you might remember this program. I wrote 5,000 lines of code to make a bird fly across the screen on a Commodore 64. You guys remember that? <laughs> For those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, it was not a bird. It was a dash line that just went up and down the screen like this. <laughs> and I'm like, really? This is what's going to be important in the future? So we've been talking about computers for a very long time. So that narrative that education hasn't changed and education is, is broken, that narrative doesn't work for me. But here's a narrative that does work for me. That what has changed is the world. And it's changed dramatically since 1995. In the last 20 years, if you think about what technology has done and how technology's wrapped itself around the core of everything that we do, and we don't even think about it anymore. For example, how many of you have not used technology today? A couple weeks ago, I asked that question, and a woman in the front row raised her hand as she was holding her phone. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to tell that story for like the rest of my life. <laughs> She's like, OK, don't use my name. But technology has wrapped itself around the core of everything we do. We don't even think about how long did it take us to get to this point. The iPhone, how many of you have iPhones? Oh, I hate to see that. All right, the iPhone. <laughs> the, it's okay. The iPhone 
The iPhone is 11 years old. Do you remember we used to have to call the internet <laughs> with our home phones? And the internet would be busy? <laughs> or it would hang up on you, right? And you were OK with that. Like, I tried to call the internet today. It was busy. <laughs> and the person you're talking to would say, did you try another number? Remember you had a list of numbers on a post-it note? Right. And what was your reward when you got online? It was a bunch of pages that had words that linked you to other pages that had words. This was the most exciting thing you'd ever seen in your life. And then, as that technology progressed, people started posting pictures on those sites. And you're like, you lose your mind. Like, everyone, come here. There's going to be a picture on my computer screen. <laughs> and that line on the bottom would just go back and forth. All right, come back in half an hour. There'll be a picture on the screen. <laughs> and what's your expectation with technology today? I, I, look, educators and people who work in education are the most patient, most understanding people in the world, and I've seen you turn into a mob at conferences when the Wi-Fi is too slow. <laughs> like pitchforks and everything. Like, I don't even know where you get the pitchforks, but pitchforks and everything <laughs> at events. I myself, this year, and I've been doing really well with this, this year I said I was going to stop using Wi-Fi on airplanes because I found myself at the end of flights frustrated because flying is hard enough, but find myself extra frustrated because web pages wouldn't load fast enough while I'm traveling through space. <laughs> and if we're the generation that most of us in this room were minding our own business when this thing called the internet showed up, what do you think that means for a generation of kids who don't even know what the world looked like before Google, who don't know what the world looked like before devices, who don't know what the world looked like before Wi-Fi? Go tell a 10-year-old kid that you're going to stay at a place that doesn't have Wi-Fi and watch them lose their mind. Like, are, are we staying in a cave? What do you mean it doesn't have Wi-Fi? Like, what, is that, what does that mean? This generation is growing up in a different world. Imagine what education looks like to them if we're still doing things that are from before 1995. Imagine what the world, and the fact that they haven't like revolted and lost their minds is, is amazing to me because they think about the world in a different way. Now, two things I want to say about them. Number one, we have to be careful with the narrative that this education was, that this generation was born with technology, therefore they know how to use these tools. They don't know how to use these tools. Evidence shows us that they don't know how to use these tools. We use words like digital native, or oh, he's a kid, he just knows how to use technology. He, they don't. Evidence shows us that they don't. There's a Stanford study from a couple years ago that I would point you guys to where 82% of the elementary school kids that they studied couldn't tell you the difference between a sponsored website and a real news site. And I can go through 10 stats like that about how they don't know how to use these tools. We need to teach them how to use these tools. In the same way, when you guys were born, you were driven home in a car, and you were around cars your whole life. Your parents didn't say when you were 16, oh, you've been around cars your whole life. Here's a car. You just naturally know how to drive a car. You were taught how to drive a car. You were taught the rules of the road. You were taught the culture of wherever you live, what the rules of the road were. We need to teach them how to use these tools. That's one thing that I want to make sure we do. But the other thing you got to think about is that this generation thinks about learning in a different way than we think about learning, simply because of the world they were born into. We waited for people to teach us. We took classes. We waited for teachers. We, we went like, I need to learn how to do X. What class can I take? Or when, when is that class going to start so I can take that class? I mean, even when I was in, when I started my professional career, I wanted to brush up on my writing, my Spanish writing skills, and I took a class at community college to do that. This generation can just learn. This is a picture of my 17-year-old when he was like 12, and he comes into my office with his laptop, and he's got a bunch of code on it, and he's all frustrated and flustered because he's got a bug in his code, and he can't seem to fix it. He doesn't know where the issue is. And I made him take a step back to take this picture because I had no idea he was learning how to code. This was during the summer. He just started learning how to code on his own. 
they think about learning in a different way. How do we take advantage of those two ideas? One, that they think about learning in a different way, and two, that they don't know how to use these tools. Imagine if we taught them how to use these tools the right way, what we could get out of them. Because learning is changing dramatically. And if you think about where technology is going, we have to understand that we are now moving into a new phase of an economy. That we are no longer preparing kids for this world and these types of jobs. Where even manufacturing jobs today require a higher set of skills to do that work. We're not even preparing kids for what we used to call white collar jobs, where people would wear white collars and go to work and do their work in offices at desks. Those jobs are shifting as well. We now live in a new phase of the economy and what I call the digitalization economy. And what I mean by digitalization, I mean everything that has to do with technology, computer science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, AR, VR, the whole package, the whole thing is digitalization. And I can tell you as someone who travels around the world, every business, every organization, every government, every state, every country is trying to figure this out. This is where we're moving. It just started in 1995. It hasn't been that long. We can't see where we are yet because we're in the middle. We're at the very beginning of this. And what we need to understand is that this language, the language of digitalization, is computer science. Computer science is the language. I'm not saying everyone needs to go become a computer scientist, but we'll talk about that in a second. But everyone needs to understand the language of computer science. Everyone needs to understand the role that it plays in the digitalization economy. In the same way that you guys had to learn English to survive in the economy as well. And we still need to do that, but we need to add digital skills, computer science to the language of the future. And by the way, I do think that a lot of people need to go become computer scientists because this is where the future is going. And I, don't, and I can pick on my own city, but I wrote down some numbers for you guys. Right now, in the state of New York, so it's not just New York City, but in the state of New York, today, not 10 years from now, not 20 years from now, today, there are 27,527 open computing jobs in the state of New York. That's 3.4 times the average demand of any other industry or any other skill. The average computer science graduate in the state of New York makes $103,000 a year which in Manhattan puts you in a dumpster. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Versus the average state salary of $60,000 a year. And that ratio is the same no matter what state you're from. What happens in our communities if we can double salaries? What's the economic impact in our communities if all of a sudden we can raise the level? I mean, almost double salaries. And here's the problem, in 2017, in New York, there are only 5,232 people that graduated with computer science degrees. Just one measure of what we can use for computer science. And 21% of them were female. And in 2018, there were only, and this is another measure that we can use in school, only 10,372 high school students took the AP computer science exam. And 35% of them were female. And here's the root cause that in New York, there are only 407 schools in New York that offer the AP Computer Science course. And that seems like a high number when you think about it, right, 407? But that's 28% of the schools that have AP programs in their schools, 28%. Now, there is nothing wrong with AP history. My dream job is to be the AP history teacher and basketball coach. That's, my, that's all I'm working towards. So if you have an opening somewhere, let me know. That's all I'm working towards. Love history, it's my favorite subject. But we have to understand that history is as important as computer science in the world that we're facing. It's not, I'm not saying go cut out all the history programs. I'm saying that we have to look at computer science, we have to look at comp computation thinking, we have to look at those skills as something that's gonna be vital for this new economy and what we're facing. Because look at what this generation is facing. Most of us in this room will recognize 
a picture like this, right? We've been watching from, those are old like me, and remember the, the people working in auto factories that then were replaced by machines that were making things or making cars, right? And now, now those of us that have seen pictures like this are recognizing or seeing that those machines that were tied to those posts and making things, those machines are getting up and they're walking around. What is this going to look like in 10 years, in 20 years? I, I walk around the world thinking about people's jobs in terms of, is that a human's job or a computer's job? What is this going to look like in 10 years? These robots now, today, not 10 years from now, today, they're starting to do things like make walls, package and deliver products, and they're even farming. What is this technology going to move like, and what is it going to look like in the next five or 10 years? I mean, think about it this way. If you want to look at it from a jobs perspective, there are 4.5 million people in this country who make a living driving things. Some of you were driven from your home to the airport, and then someone drove you, you know, on the airplane, if you think about that as a driving thing, and then someone drove you from the airport to the hotel. 4.5 million people make a living driving supplies, people, equipment, those types of things, and you can go buy a self-driving car today. Two weeks ago, you had to drop 150 to buy a self-driving car, and now you can drop 30, 35 and buy a self-driving car. What's this technology going to look like in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, to the driving industry? This is happening across all industries and across the board, right? Because everyone in this room recognizes this picture, right? This is a supermarket. And you have to ask yourself, what are the workers in that supermarket doing? What work are they doing? And what they're doing is what I call process work. They're taking your cans, they're scanning them, and they're putting, putting them in a bag for you, and then they're watching you use the keypad. This job is so simple and so easy, you can do it. Because what do you find in supermarkets today? Self-service checkout. Anyone take a training class on how to do self-service checkout? I, look, I wish some people would take a training class. But those people aside, I know this job is easy, and I know you can do it because my four-year-old does it. I'm going to have a bunch of kindergarten kids scanning things at supermarkets soon. You have to ask, what's next? Well, Amazon is saying, well, why do people need to check anything, else, any, anything out at all? Why can't people check themselves in, take things off the shelf, put them in the bags, and just walk out of the store? The technology is moving faster and faster and faster. The change is happening faster and faster and faster. Now, we have to look back at the supermarket example and ask ourselves, does that mean that supermarket jobs are going away? No. This narrative that you hear today, like automation and robots are coming to steal your jobs, that's not what's happening. What is happening is that jobs are changing. Because if you think about the supermarket example, I don't, how many of you like going grocery shopping? Okay, you're weirdos. I hate, <laughs> I hate grocery shopping. And when I was single, I hated it even more because I would go to the, because I only know, I only knew how to make like two dishes, right? Like soup and like pizza. And so I'd go to the store and buy the same 10 crappy things and put them in the cart and it's just like, it was a processed job, right? You're buying the same stuff. Some of you are the same. Some of you are buying the same 20 crappy things and putting them in your basket every week, and it's this terrible experience. But now, I'm a supermarket owner. I don't have to hire process workers anymore. Now I can hire different workers. Because now I can hire dietitians, nutritionists, cooks. So when you come to my grocery store, I can ask you right up front, like, hey, what, what's your diet? What, what nutrition plan are you on? What, what do you want to make tonight? Oh, lasagna, you've never made it? Come here, let me guide you through what you need to do. I'll get all the ingredients for you. We'll make it. Oh, you don't know how to bake those two things together? Come over to my demo station, and I'll show you how to do this. We can hire 
different skill of labor. And by the way, this has been happening in industries forever. It's just happening faster now. Like, if you think about the banking industry, when was the last time one of you walked into a bank, filled out that little piece of paper with a pen that's doing a life sentence, and, and go up to the front and go to the teller and say, I would like $20 in cash, please. Try it, it's fun, because the teller would be like, I don't understand, is this a bank robbery? What's going on? <laughs> because unless you're my father-in-law, you would never go into the bank to get cash. If you have cash at all, because you could walk around the world with no cash, you use an ATM machine. But here's the thing. There are more people working in the banking industry today than they were when ATMs were introduced. There are more people working in banks today than they were when ATMs were introduced. They're just doing a different job. And this has been true across all industries. I, as I was studying this topic, as I was doing my research, I realized that automation and robotics were, have been part of my life since I started working 25 years ago. The first time I showed up to work 25 years ago, there was a word processing machine on my desk. And that's how I would type emails or letters and then print them on my dot matrix printer. But a couple years before that, I would have to write it out on a piece of paper, a legal pad, and hand it to a typing pool. And it was a, a pool of people that would type it up on a typewriter for you and hand it back, and you'd make corrections, and you go back and forth, and two weeks would go by before you can send something out. <laughs> and, then, and now, you can type it up yourself and just send it in the fax machine. Remember fax machine? And send it in the fax machine. This has been happening across all industry. All jobs are changing. And so if that's happening faster and faster, you have to recognize that this is happening across all jobs. Not just low-level jobs, not just low-income jobs. All jobs are being impacted by automation and, and, and robotics and computers, just like your jobs have been affected by it. So to me, it's not necessarily that these robots and computers are coming to take your job, it's that they're coming to take parts of your job. And they have been for a very long time. So given this, Given this whole point about what automation and robotics is doing, we have to ask ourselves, what, is the, what does learning mean in this world? What does learning need to look like? And I think about this all the time with my four-year-old. What does learning need to do? Now, that's not when she called me an asshole, but it's pretty close. Now, this idea that you learn subjects, that you take a subject and you learn it in this linear way, and then you get tested on it, and then you do that. that is that going to work for this future? Absolutely not. We have to re-examine the concept of learning and understand that it's dynamic, that it's ongoing. And by the way, here's a theory that I have. It has never been more possible to, than today to learn. Learning happens at a speed that is unbelievable. My own personal example is, if you think about what Abraham Lincoln, right? Think about what the world looked like back when Abraham Lincoln was around, since we used him before. Think about what the world looked like, infrastructure, technology, transportation, you know, everything. And then think about the world today and everything that we have in front of us with transportation systems and technology and computers and electricity and lights and everything that we have. And then realize that everything that we have today, everything that we have today was available to us when Abraham Lincoln was around. It's always been there. It wasn't like some spaceship crash landed and dropped off new technology for us 20 years ago, like in a Spider-Man movie. This has been around, the resources that we use to make the things of today have been around for 200 years. We, what was the difference? Why didn't we invent this 200 years ago? It's because learning took too long. Learning was a longer process. It took longer to learn 200 years ago. If you wanted to find someone who knew something about something, in, in the 1800s, you had to get on a train and drive across the country and find someone. And it was just this whole process that went into learning. Today, learning happens faster and faster and faster. It's unbelievable. And my own personal example of this is that six months ago, I had this idea of launching a YouTube channel. And I called my daughter, who's a video producer and has a degree in film. And I said, OK, I want to start this YouTube channel. What's the first thing I need to know? And she said, OK, look, film in 1080 at 24 frames per second. Try to keep your ISO at about 100. And I said, OK, what do any of those words mean? 
And today, six months later, I have, I didn't know anything about editing or filming or what I needed to do. And today I have seven, seven videos on YouTube. And these videos, by the way, if I have you subscribe and get your kids to subscribe, these are all about career tips. It's all about, um, you know, like for example, one video is on validation versus feedback. Another one is on, the one I'm working on right now is about the speed of learning. The one here in New York is gonna be about presentation skills and tips. So it's trying to you know, bring all that knowledge to a new generation. The speed of learning happens today faster than any time in history. How do we take advantage of that? Because when you think about the skills that this generation needs, I boil them down to this group right here. To me, if I can get my four-year-old to focus on these things, Problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, ability to learn, and creativity. Those things kind of encompass everything for me. Like, you know, some other people will say communication skills. Well, I put that under creativity. Some people say digital skills. I say, well, that fits under critical thinking. I think everything that we think about when it comes to the, you know, the 20, remember the 21st century skills? How long we've been, we've been talking about the 21st century skills for so long. It's, we're 20 years into the 21st century, and we're still talking about 21st century skills. My kid's gonna be around in the 22nd century, right? So we've been talking about these for a long time. So, but we need to ask new questions. For example, collaboration. We talk about collaboration in education, but we don't really mean it, because education system is set up as a single player sport. The reality is we live in a team-based world, and I think that after school programs is where real collaboration happens where you can really get, I mean, if, or if kids are spending all day listening to a subject in the classroom, when they get together and do stuff with each other, especially different grade levels, different skill levels, collaboration can happen in after school programs. Another example would be, you know, the ability to learn. I'm not saying the ability to study or the ability to memorize or the ability to highlight something in the textbook. I'm saying the ability to start with a self-assessment that says, I don't know how to do something. Where can I learn how to do it? But the one I really want to focus on in the time I have today is the first one because we're all guilty of this. We still ask kids today, all of you are guilty of this and it's okay, this is a, like a rehab center we're going to go through today. We all ask kids today, what do you want to be when you grow up? All of you are guilty of this. Because I talked to students, all, I talked to about 2,000 students this year so far, and I asked them that question. How many of you have been asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? Every single hand has gone up every time I've ever asked that question. All of us are guilty of asking this question. And it makes sense because that was the question that people asked us when we were kids. And back then, in the olden days, that made sense. We had like 100 jobs, or jobs were very stable. They didn't shift as much as they're shifting today. Today, that question doesn't make sense anymore. Jobs are changing too fast. New jobs are being created all the time. You've seen stats that say 65% of the jobs of the future don't exist today. I'm working for a company and in a job that didn't exist 20 years ago and is now a dominant player in the economy? That question doesn't make sense. But here's the new question. Here's the question we should be asking students. What problem do you want to solve? What's the problem that spins in your head? It doesn't have to be a social problem. It doesn't have to be solving world hunger. We tend to think of problems in terms of a global scale. It doesn't have to be that. It could be how to make cars go faster, how to make better remote controls, how to make, make better monitors. How, my daughter's not solving a global problem. The problem that she wants to solve is to tell better stories through video with a female Latina perspective. That's the job that she, that's the problem that she wants to work on. The problem doesn't matter. It's the process of problem solving that you go through because the second question is just as important. The second question is, what do you need to learn to solve that problem? What are the knowledge, the skills, and the abilities you need to have to solve that problem? And then tying this back to digital skills, they have the world at their fingertips. What classes can you take online, offline? What materials out there? What blogs are out there? What newsletters are out there? What, what research, research is out there? What publications are out there? Who's solving this problem now, and how are they solving it? 
And then the next question that we can ask them is how do you want to solve that problem? How do you want to take the skills that you want to focus on? How do you take the skills that you've already developed to solve that problem? Because it has to be personal to the person. Because if, if, my, if my kid said to me, you know, I, I want to solve, solve climate change, you know, the typical answer would be, well, you need to go become a scientist. But if my kid was into videos and doing productions like she had been doing for 50, for the, since she was five years old, I might say to her instead, like, take that skill and go document what's happening with climate change. How do you want to solve that problem? What's your angle on that problem? And by the way, this gets us closer to what Daniel Pink talked about in his book, Drive, if you haven't read it. It's about what motivates all of us as human beings. It's the same three things. Everyone in this room is motivated by the same three things. Purpose. What problem do you want to solve? Autonomy, how do you want to solve it? And mastery, what do you need to learn to solve that problem? So I think that, to me, is the most important one. This, this girl here in the middle, Anne, uh, kind of illustrates this whole point because for her Google Science Fair prize that she won, she had a problem that she wanted to solve. She had a friend who lived in the Philippines and her friend didn't have electricity, so she went and invented a flashlight that's powered by the heat of the human hand. And she was 15 years old when she did this. By the way, there's, a, there's the, I think she's Swedish, and a, another 16-year-old was just nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for her work in uh, advocating for climate, in climate change. That would be two teenagers that have won the Nobel Peace Prize in the last five years. All right, yeah, that, that, these are the kids. These are the kids who are in our classes. These are the kids who are in our program. Sorry, I already talked about this. Collaboration and ability to learn. So what, what is it that we need? We need a culture shift. We don't need to invent anything new. We don't need to start new. We have to think about how do we move from an old model that served us really well for a very long time. Again, education isn't broken. It, we built a superpower of a nation on the education system we built in this country. And then ask ourselves, how do we move from what served us well for a very long time to something that we know we need today, where kids are making things and building things and doing things and collaborating and problem solving? And I think after school programs are a great place to build those skills. I think that's where they're going to do it. And the kids who go to after school programs should have an advantage over the other kids who don't go to after school programs because that's where they're developing these skills. I'll give you a quick Google example of what this looks like. This is the original Google.com. <laughs> this is it. This is Larry and Sergey putting a couple machines together, and this is what Google looks like today. This is one row of the gazillions of rows of servers and data centers that we have all over the world, and there's three quick things I want to point out here. Number one, oops, where's the back button? Number one, this today can happen anywhere. This doesn't have to be in Northern California. This doesn't have to be in Palo Alto. I don't live in Northern California. I don't like Northern California. Every time I land in Northern California, I tweet out, I smell kale. I don't like Northern California. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker. I'm not allowed to live in Northern California. This, two of your students anywhere in the country have a thousand times more computing power than Larry and Sergey had when they started Google. What can they build with that? Two. This is not what Google looked like on Monday, and then this is what it looked like on Thursday. This took 19 years of what we're talking about, 19 years of problem solving, critically thinking, 19 years of collaboration. We have to have some patience. We have to build it. And then the third thing is that this is not what a data center is going to look like 19 years from today. There is no future data center. There's just the next wire, the next casing, the next light bulb, the next, the next, the next. And that's what we need in education. There is no future classroom. It's the future classroom starts on Monday and then Tuesday and then Wednesday. The future after school program starts on Monday and then Tuesday and Wednesday. It's constant and consistent because that's the world that we live in now. The world moves too fast to try to build something for five years from now or 10 years from now. We now live in a time where you have to constantly build it all of the time. Here's the good news. We're just getting started. We're at the very beginning of this. This is the beginning of this. I think this is the most exciting time in history and the most exciting time in education. We've been here before. 
back with another technology called electricity. Thomas Edison had his plant up and running in the 1800s, and he couldn't get people to sign up because business leaders were saying, that electricity thing, that's a fad. It wasn't until the business leaders changed their models that they started taking advantage of electricity where you saw change. So it's not the invention, it's not technology that's the innovation or the invention. It's how people who use the old technology switch to using the new technology and adapt to that technology. So as I close out and I'm out of time, I want to leave you with this last thought. I want you to follow me on Twitter, connect with me on LinkedIn, um, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, you guys want to be on my YouTube channel? Here, everyone, I, I need you all to sign a waiver. Okay, all right. There you go, all right, you're all, you're all gonna be in the next, in the New York version of the YouTube channel. But I want you, to, I want to leave you with this thought. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about my four-year-old. And then I want you to think about whatever technology it is that you have, whether it's your MacBook, your iPad, your, uh, your iPhone, which most of you have, your whatever that new technology is. For me, it's the Pixel 3 XL, the most innovative phone in the world. <laughs> I'm kidding. But I want you to think about this technology, and I want you to think about my foil and realize that this is the worst technology she will ever see in her life. This is her Commodore 64. In 20 years, she's gonna find this in a 50 cent box at a thrift store, and she's gonna to wanna to buy it to put on her shelf like a museum piece. Like, and she's gonna look at it and she's gonna to say to her younger friends or her younger, her, her, the people that she's hanging out with babysitting, she's gonna say, look, my dad had one of these. There's the port. And the younger kids are gonna say, what's that for? And she's gonna say, Okay, you're not going to believe me, but there's YouTube videos about this. My dad had to plug this into the wall. <laughs> and the kids are going to say, what, like to activate the nuclear cell? And no. He had to plug this into the wall every single day. <laughs> For hours, this thing was plugged into the wall. And those young kids are going to look at him and be like, with disgust on their face, like, oh my God, how did those people live like that? Those are the kids who are coming into our school system in the fall. Are we ready for them? Do we have the right models for them? Do we have the right business practices in place? Do we have the right after school program so that they can develop the knowledge, the skills, and the abilities that they need to solve the problems that they're gonna be interested in solving, that they're gonna be passionate about? Thank you guys very much.